I'm honored and very proud to um, introduce to you Dr. Lee Gettler, a fresh new PhD out of Northwestern University, whose advisors are Chris Kuzawa and Tom McDade. Uh, just as Katie has elevated so exponentially the level of research and the importance of breast milk um, and its investigation, so too I'm very proud to say is Dr. Lee Gettler doing the same for our understanding of male hormonal physiology and the way it underlies males' transition from one reproductive status to another. Dr. Gettler already has made the news on several fronts in terms of his um, discovery that indeed when males partner with women, um, as might be predicted, uh, testosterone does significantly decline. He is likely to be doing very important things with prolactin and estrogen um, and oxytocin in males using life history theory as well. So we have a long career ahead of us since we anticipate Dr. Gettler, who received his degree here at the University of Notre Dame, I'm very proud to say. And I will let him have the floor now, Dr. Gettler. OK. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Jim, for that kind introduction. Uh, such an honor to be a part of this symposium. Thank you, Darsha, for inviting me. Um, I had the the great honor of being wedged between uh, Katie Hind and Francis Champagne, who are doing some of the most elegant and uh, innovative research on kind of intergenerational transfers of biology and behavior. So I had the great um, experience of looking at the schedule and thinking, wow, I get to speak between Katie and Francis, and then going, oh god, I have to speak between Katie and Francis. <laughs> so hopefully I live up to uh, the bar that Katie just set, and uh, that I'm sure Francis will uh, meet or raise this afternoon. So I'm going to shift uh, the topics a little bit here, and I'm going to talk mostly about fathers uh, for the beginning portion of my talk, and then um, later I'm going to lay out some rather preliminary hypotheses about whether we can think about grand maternal physiology and whether that can tell us anything about the role of grandmothers in human evolution, as uh, myself and a few other scholars have argued that looking at paternal physiology can tell us about the role of fathers in human evolution. So I'm going to begin here with a relatively long quote. Hopefully I won't put this many words on any of the rest of my slides. But uh, this comes from Dr. Michael Lamb, who's the leading developmental psychologist in the world in terms of looking at the impact of fathers on child development. Um, as you can see, this is a relatively old quote, and Michael is a friend of mine, so I think he'll, uh, he's a, he would be okay with me using him as my uh, straw man or scapegoat in this case. But what Michael said in a paper in 1985 is, almost fell off the stage, uh, <laughs> the hormonal argument proposes that women who are hormonally prepared for pregnancy, parturition, and lactation are primed similarly for the nurturant child care tasks that are also essential for the survival of offspring. Men who do not, quote, need to participate in child care would not have these capacities. So obviously, uh, being interested in the role of fathers in human evolution, I'm focused on this latter red phrase. Uh, and in many ways, this is essentially the null hypothesis for my research. If fathers really were not involved with helping to take care of young in the course of human evolution, then we shouldn't see any sort of relatively comparable hormonal changes in fathers to what we see in mammalian mothers. Now, Katie alluded a bit to uh, life history theory. I'm not going to kind of go through any of the major tenets of life history theory, but life history theorists kind of refer to what we call a paradox of human life history, which is that uh, like other great apes, our infants are born highly immature. But our children grow and develop very slowly. Um, we're often referred to as having an early childhood and then a prolonged juvenile period. Uh, so essentially, our offspring develop slowly and mature very late. Yet we have high relative fertility. So we're producing these really costly offspring in the sense that it takes a long time to raise them until they're independent. And yet we're raising multiple offspring at the same time. And in combination with that, our offspring survive at a higher rate into adulthood than we see in the other great ape species. So this is a relative paradox from a theoretical level. How is this possible? How in the environments in which our hominin ancestors lived, how did this come to fruition? And so if I could just highlight this briefly, 
the space between births in humans and natural fertility populations. Barry showed some of this data earlier today. Uh, if you compare humans to chimpanzees, and these are, these are kind of crude numbers that um, I put together from a variety of different sources. There's some variability here, but you can see that on average, humans have infants much more frequently than do our closest relatives. And then if you compare the survival of our offspring into uh, adulthood, human children, human juveniles survive at a much higher rate into adulthood than do human foragers or the children of human foragers. So this, this represents a paradox, and there's a question of how did we get here? How is it that this was possible in the course of hominin evolution since we last shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees? Uh, Sarah, Sarah Hurdy, Kristen Hawks, uh, Karen Kramer have all kind of pioneered this idea uh, in various ways of cooperative breeding, and I'm just going to kind of generically define that as uh, other group members or owl parents would have assisted mothers with childcare and provisioning responsibilities. The likely candidates that have uh, been proposed, uh, Karen Kramer and others have done very elegant work on older siblings. Kristen Hawks and then later Sarah Hurdy have discussed the importance of grandmothers and female kin and uh, the idea that fathers uh, partnered with mothers to raise offspring and contribute to the evolution of human life history has been around for many decades. So in terms of the role of fathers in human evolution, there's a very important symposium and edited volume, Man the Hunter, came around, I think around 40 or 50 years ago now. Uh, and that volume focused primarily, well, it focused on the, the importance of hunting as a kind of a contributing factor to many aspects of what makes humans unique. Now, this model has been critiqued on a variety of levels, including uh, by cartoonists, and I'm not sure how well you can see that, but uh, I think the, uh, the female in here is that telling the male that uh, Mammoth was standing on the resources that she wanted to forage, so she killed him. Um, but this is just playing on the idea that, that Barry really alluded to earlier, that you do see some uh, kind of gender separation behavior, but there's much more fluidity than kind of this model allowed for. And yet, the idea that men kind of as fathers were really just provisioning their partners and their offspring uh, has persisted much longer than many of the other ideas that were uh, a tenet of the man the hunter model. And so that's supposed to be a does not equal sign. But fathering doesn't necessarily equate to provisioning only. Um, Barry's work in the Aka was really one of, if no, Barry's work in the Aka was the first really thorough ethnography that showed the importance of fathers in other domains. And since then, others have kind of taken up that mantle, and in particular, uh, Myself and Jeff Winking have tried to model the ways in which physical care and male direct caregiving could have contributed to the evolution of human life history, um, again, from a theoretical perspective. Now, why is this important? What fathers were doing? How can we tell what fathers were doing? In some ways, from an archaeological perspective, your guess is as good as mine. To my knowledge, uh, there's never been an archaeologist who's stumbled upon some uh, great cachet of male bathing basins or male frontal baby carriers. Uh, these, these types of artifacts just don't exist in the archaeological record, so it's really difficult to develop models of what men were necessarily doing in the course of human evolution. However, one line of evidence we can potentially draw on is looking at male reproductive uh, in social physiology, and developing hypotheses based on cross-taxonomic com comparisons and looking at the ways in which potentially nat natural selection has shaped male physiology in other species where fathers help to raise young, and then developing hypotheses as to whether those same sort of patterns exist in human fathers. So this would give us a sense that the behaviors that fathers were engaging in in the course of human evolution were sufficiently important that natural selection actually helped shape their reproductive and social physiology to respond to interacting with their children and providing for their children in predictable ways. Across taxonomic lines, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but the research has focused primarily on the way two hormones respond to fatherhood. And the first is testosterone, which is generally characterized as, as being a pro-mating hormone because of its effects on things like uh, body size, strength, uh, sexual ornament ornamentation, competitive behavior, territoriality, things like that. And then secondly, uh, 
prolactin, which is thought to be a parenting hormone or a, a hormone that promotes parenting in males, uh, as its name kind of indicates, uh, prolactin is perhaps best known uh, for its role in mammalian lactation. It's a very phylogenetically ancient hormone. Uh, it predates the evolution of lactation, the evolution of mammals as a taxonomic category. It's found in fish. It's found in amphibians. It's found in reptiles. Um, it's really important in birds, as I'll, as I'll show you. So these two hormones uh, provide us some means to look across taxonomic lines where we know that paternal care has evolved, and we can look at stereotypical patterns and then use those patterns, again, to develop hypotheses about humans. So briefly, uh, testosterone production is a result of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Uh, the hypothalamus produces a hormone called uh, GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. It stimulates cells in the pituitary, pituitary gland to release luteinizing hormone, which then travels through the peripheral circulation to the testes, and testosterone is released. Prolactin is also a product, uh, product of the pituitary gland, and it's primary under, primarily under control of dopamine neurons. Now, when dopamine increases, uh, prolactin declines, and then prolactin will feed back onto those dopamine neurons uh, in a negative feedback loop. Both of these hormones, uh, although released in peripheral circulation, can cross the blood-brain barrier and actually activate uh, receptors in the brain to affect behavior. So that's one of the principal reasons that um, they're useful to look at um, in the sense of trying to understand behavior. So the big question or perhaps one of the big questions is why study testosterone in paternal care? I sort of alluded to some of the functions of testosterone uh, a few minutes ago. In the late 70s and early 80s, ornithologists were developing field-friendly methods to go out and, and look at hormone levels in birds uh, under wild conditions, natural conditions. And once they developed sufficient data, they found that during the breeding season, when males are competing for territories, they're competing for the attention of females, uh, they're trying to attract females, their testosterone is generally higher. And then when they transition to the period in which they help, they cooperate with mothers to raise young, their testosterone was generally lower. Uh, this was a fairly robust pattern. Um, over 90% of all bird species have some sort of male-female cooperation in terms of raising young. And eventually, uh, John Wingfield and colleagues uh, put together a synthesis and a theoretical model uh, called the challenge hypothesis which sort of brought together all of the research uh, on competitiveness and testosterone and parental care and testosterone in birds. And the challenge hypothesis has subsequently inspired research in mammals and fish and a variety of other taxa uh, based on the role of androgens and male behavior. In human males, uh, although the correlations between a peripheral hormone like testosterone and behavioral patterns are substantially lower uh, and much messier than in birds. Um, there is some evidence that high testosterone could be sort of consummate with what we might describe as mating behavior. Um, there's some correlations between competitive behavior, the number of sexual partners men report, uh, risk-taking behavior, uh, and marital problems. And then in terms of low testosterone, uh, two different studies in the early 2000s found that when men were exposed to infant cries, recorded infant cries, the men with lower testosterone reported a greater need to respond to the crying infant, a greater sympathy uh, for the distressed infant. So that's kind of the, the full, in terms of low testosterone, that, that's some of the full battery of uh, data that's available in terms of this hypothesis. So it's kind of an open area of research. In human fathers, uh, in the early 2000s, in the mid-2000s, there was a growing number of cross-cultural studies that were done, uh, particularly by uh, Peter Gray, who is an anthropologist at UNLV. We also have a Peter Gray in our midst here, uh, two different scholars. And Peter found in a variety of contexts that this pattern uh, tended to, to replicate across cultural boundaries, uh, boundaries, although there was some important variation based on things like polygyny and uh, male investment. What you see is unmarried men have highest testosterone, married non-fathers are sort of intermediate, and then married fathers uh, have the lowest testosterone. Uh, following up on some of Peter's work, um, Martin Muller and colleagues did a really, a really cool, very elegant anthropological study where they 
they looked at testosterone in two different cultural groups in Tanzania, uh, the Datoga, who are pastoralists, where the father's, the extent of father's investment is to provide basically caloric resources for their family. They don't help take care of young. They're not kind of involved in direct child care. And then the Hadza, who are a foraging group where the fathers are actively involved to some extent in helping to take care of young, although they also help uh, provision. And what he found is that in the Datoga, where fathers are not involved, there's no difference in testosterone between fathers and non-fathers. And in the Hadza, when you comp compare fathers and non-fathers, there's a highly significant difference in their testosterone levels. So this was really the first demonstration that cultural models, cultural expectations of what fathers do and the roles that fathers play actually has substantial implications for the way in which their physiology kind of responds to uh, the experience of parenthood. Now, prolactin in human fathers has been studied even less. You can see there's lots of question marks about it. Uh, that those same studies that found that men with lower testosterone were more inclined to respond to or expressed the desire to respond to crying infants found that men with higher prolactin also expressed uh, a higher need to respond. Uh, there's a study of Israeli fa fathers that found that fathers with higher prolactin engaged in more exploratory, stimulatory play with their children. Um, and this was a, a particularly important study because the the extent to which prolactin actually accounted for a large percentage of the variance in men's behavior um, was first shown in this case. So if you're wondering, well, do any of these hormones actually matter for men's behavior? In this study in particular, father's prolactin values accounted for 30% uh, of the variance in their play behaviors with their children. So there is some evidence that, that these hormones uh, do matter in terms of the way in which fathers interact with their children. In the only prior study that compared prolactin among fathers and non-fathers, uh, it was shown that uh, Peter Gray in Jamaica found that fathers and non-fathers did not differ. So there no, there's never been, prior to our research, there were never any longitudinal studies of men's reproductive physiology relative to fatherhood. Uh, which brings up issues of causality. There's very few data points on the role of uh, prolactin in male reproductive behavior, but especially fathering behavior. Uh, and there is some preliminary evidence and, and interesting uh, data points showing connections between the hormones and men's role as caregivers. So in order to expand uh, somewhat on these uh, very important studies, I was lucky enough to work on a project in Cebu City in the Philippines. Uh, Cebu City, Metro Cebu, is the second largest metropolitan area in the Philippines uh, behind Manila. This study, which I'll describe in more detail on the next slide, um, originally sampled all of these neighborhoods that are highlighted. Uh, the green neighborhoods that are highlighted are peripheral rural areas. The blue uh, neighborhoods are all highly densely populated urban areas. Uh, so the project was designed as a representative study of this community. It originally began as a study that was focused on uh, maternal feeding choices and infant diarrheal morbidity. So early in the project, when it began in 1983, they enrolled around 3,300 pregnant women, and they subsequently followed them at multiple waves of data collection throughout their infancy period and then as the children moved out of the infancy period, the project uh, took on some different orientations and they followed the children up through their adolescence in, and into early adulthood. And at this point in time, uh, one of my former uh, advisors became affiliated with the project and, and really turned its focus, to, at least on the male side, to male reproductive ecology and male reproductive physiology. So we were, this is really the first study longitudinal study that would have testosterone data available um, in adulthood longitudinally um, looking at men and allowing us to test some hypotheses about the transition to parenthood. So we had, again, testosterone data from 2005 when the men were roughly 21 or 22 years old, and then we had testosterone data on them again at age 26. The sample size is actually slightly larger than this, but as I'll describe in a few minutes, 
uh, we had a sample of 465 men who were single non-fathers at age 21, which is an important caveat in terms of trying to look at the causality and the way in which testosterone actually shifts with kind of demographic sh shifts, such as becoming uh, a new partner, getting married, uh, or having a child. And then in 2000, uh, we only have prolactin data, which you have to get from blood uh, from 2005. I was able to, with my advisor, Tom McDade, uh, modify an assay, uh, serum-based prolactin assay, and look at it in dry blood spots, which allowed us to actually look at these data uh, in the field in the Philippines, or to collect blood spot data in the field in the Philippines and then transport them back to Northwestern um, and analyze them. But we were not able to collect that same data in 2009, so uh, just bear in mind that the prolactin data is uh, cross-sectional. So in 2005, all of our data, the demographic and behavioral data, were collected at baseline. And again, in 2009, so we collected saliva samples for testosterone analysis. Um, one of the fantastic things about steroid hormones is they show up in their unbound form in saliva, which, especially in men, closely parallels the levels circulating in plasma. So this is a relatively non-invasive way of being able to collect uh, biological samples, and then which allows us to look at, at steroid hormones. When you're talking about protein hormones like prolactin, prolactin does not show up in saliva, so we really had to have uh, a medium related to blood. So bloods, dried blood spots were the best possible uh, solution that we had uh, to effectively collect blood in the field in the Philippines. Now this is a bit of a uh, straw man argument, but prior to our study, there really was no, no one had had the data available to test whether fatherhood actually caused men's testosterone to decline. It was plausible that men with low testosterone were simply more likely to become fathers. Now, what we know about testosterone and how it operates, um, particularly in other species, suggests that, that that probably wasn't the case, but um, in order to fully kind of vet this, this hypothesis, you needed longitudinal data. And so to test this, again, we had 465 men. In 2005, all of them are single non-fathers. And then you can see by 2009, rough, roughly half of them have remained um, single non-fathers. A smaller percentage of them have become married or partnered, but don't have kids. And then uh, roughly a third of them had become partnered fathers by 2009 or age 26. So what we see here, the purple line is AM testosterone. The green line is uh, PM testosterone. And testosterone has a fairly steep uh, diurnal curve, which you can see this is their AM testosterone in 2005. This is their AM testosterone in, or PM testosterone in 2009. So you can see that their AM levels are substantially higher at both time points. So generally, when you're assaying testosterone, you try to collect it at both waking and before bed so you can get uh, an assessment of how it changes over the course of the day. So these are the men who are neither parents nor partnered in 2005 and in 2009. And you can see there's actually a decline between age 21 and 26 in these men, um, what we might interpret as simply an age-related decline. When we look at the men who move from being single and childless to being partnered, but still not having kids, you can see they have a more substantial decline. Or if you can't see it, you'll see it better in the next slide. And then finally, on the far right, we have the men who became new partners, newly partnered new fathers. So they were single in 2005. They didn't have any kids in 2005. And then in 2009, they're newly married, and they're first-time fathers. And what you can see is that the slope of their decline is substantially more, and just visually, or with me highlighting it, I hope you can see that their testosterone is actually higher before they become fathers. Um, I don't really have time to present this, but actually testosterone prior to fatherhood, when they're single, actually predicts whether they become partnered fathers. So uh, that actually totally throws out the window the possibility that low testosterone just leads to fatherhood. We're seeing here that this is their change in testosterone over that five-year period. You can see that the men who stay single and childless have somewhat of an age-related decline. The men who become newly married and don't have kids are intermediate between the two. And on the far right, you have the men who are newly partnered, new fathers, and they experience a very dramatic decline in testosterone. That median value 
uh, for both AM and PM testosterone is somewhere in the range of around 30 to 40 percent. So this is a very substantial decline on average in men's testosterone related to the transition to parenthood. So kind of, in, again, inspired by Martin Moeller's study where he looked at uh, testosterone and, and child care patterns across cultural settings, we wanted to ask whether child care was related to lower testosterone. So when we compared men, and these are self-reported values on how much child care they're doing, when we compare men who perform child care to men who do not, you can see that there is a general trend for men who perform more child care to have lower testosterone, and those, those values are significantly different for the groups on the far right here in terms of AM testosterone, and on the far right here in terms of PM testosterone. So this is uh, consistent with the idea that childcare might be actually playing a role in reducing men's testosterone. Recently, in the last uh, two months, Jim McKenna and I and uh, my colleagues at Northwestern published a paper on co-sleeping and testosterone, and we were the first ones to ever show that men who co-sleep, who are sharing a sleeping surface with their children, have lower testosterone than men who do not share a sleeping surface with their children. Um, we have to be a little more cautious in our interpretation of these data because co-sleeping, same surface familial co-sleeping is incredibly normative in Cebu. 92% of all the men in our sample reported sharing a sleeping surface with their partners and their children. And 95, when you include, this group is, is very small. I actually should have put their sample sizes here. This is only around 3% of the, the uh, sample. This is 92%. So, only 5% of the fathers in our sample are actually sleeping separately from their kids. So there potentially could be something else going on here in terms of these men are, not, are sort of behaving in a culturally atypical fashion, and perhaps there's some other reason that their testosterone is elevated, and that, that's sort of mediating the, the decision between their co-sleeping practice and their testosterone. But these data are at least suggestive. In terms of our prolactin analysis, Again, we have uh, sort of a snapshot of men's prolactin in 2005 on roughly 300 men. When we just break them down based on whether they are fathers or not fathers, in 2005, we see that men who are fathers have higher prolactin than men who are not fathers. This is consistent with what we see in birds. Uh, it's consistent with the role of prolactin in fish. It's consistent with the role of prolactin in many uh, mammalian species. When we break, oh, that's real bad. <laughs> uh, when we break this down further by uh, symbols and wingdings, um, <laughs> these, are, uh, these are different categories of romantic status. Uh, I believe that these are the single men who, are, who report not being in a relationship at all. These are the men who are partnered but in a less serious relationship. These are married men who don't have kids, and these are married fathers. So married fathers. And there's very few single fathers, so we don't really ha we're not really able to look at that in this cultural context. Um, it's just not terribly common, especially these men are only around 21 or 22 years old at this point. So, oh. so you can see that this, is, this elevation in prolactin is related to fatherhood. It's not related to their romantic status. Here. Uh, <laughs> These are, uh, on the far left, are expectant fathers. So they're men, we were able to calculate back to whether uh, men were expecting a child prior to sampling. This is if men have an infant, so a one-year-old child or less. And on the far right is men who have children, but they're outside the infancy period. And you can see that uh, in the middle, the men who have infants uh, have especially high prolactin. And the men who are fathers but have older children actually look more like the men who are not fathers than they do the men who have, uh, are parents to infants, suggesting there may be kind of something really intensive about the infancy period that, that may relate to men's elevated men's testa or prolactin. So all these data, and, and based on kind of cross-taxonomic comparisons, where we know that paternal care has evolved and there seems to be adaptive physiological, con physiological connections between male care behaviors and male physiology, the conclusion from these data is suggestive that males have this flexible neuroendocrine 
system that responds to fatherhood, but it really seems to depend on the context in which that fatherhood takes place. Are they in a cultural setting where fathers are, are kind of culturally expected to help take care of their young? Um, do they themselves, within the context of that cultural setting, then make the decision to actively take care of their children? Um, how old is their youngest child? What's going on during that infancy period? There's a lot of kind of specific cultural and individual variables that seem to uh, have to come to fruition to really kind of bring these physiological changes out of human fathers. It doesn't seem to be something that's specifically canalized where this, the explicit experience of becoming a parent automatically leads to these physiological changes. We have suggestive evidence that father-child contact uh, seems to help play a role in driving these biological changes. But we don't know very much about the role of indirect care in other forms of paternal investment. Um, Frank Marlowe did an elegant study also with the Hadza where he showed that during the early infancy period, fathers actually fairly dramatically increased their foraging efficiency rate or their foraging, foraging returns to help compensate somewhat for the reduced foraging returns of their partner while she's nursing a very uh, dependent infant. And so there, there's some interesting questions there about how that sort of investment, uh, which we, was likely quite important in the course of human evolution, uh, could relate to changes in men's hormones. So if you recall this slide, um, the other categories of, of individuals that I suggested or that others have suggested might have been important were grandmothers and female kin or, and older siblings. So what I'm going to try to do now, okay, <laughs> is set up whether you could use the same sort of logic, this kind of cross taxonomic rationale to set up hypotheses about the ways in which grandmothers in particular um, might respond to investing in their grand offspring. I was originally going to try and apply this model to both grandmothers and older siblings, and the monster kept growing on me. So now I'm just focusing on grandmothers. But to start with, I wanted to do a brief review of what we know about non-parental allocare in other species. So again, in terms of the work that myself and, and Peter Gray and Frank Marlowe and uh, Martin Moeller have done in human fathers, there's really a cross, a strong cross taxonomic rationale for developing hypotheses about paternal biology and the potential that natural selection has shaped paternal biology in specific ways in humans. It's less, it's an open question as to whether the same sort of logic might apply to other non-caregivers, non-parental caregivers. Uh, Carol Vleck and colleagues, as far as I could tell, uh, were really the first to kind of ask this question uh, in terms of looking at birds. And they kind of posed the question, um, is helping behavior where you have a breeding pair and then you have other kind of close to reproductively viable or adult individuals that help them raise their young but are not themselves reproducing, is that adaptive helping behavior or is it misplaced parenting, as they called it? Um, and their hypothesis was that if you found specific hormonal mechanisms that facilitated al non-parental allocare, that would really suggest that natural selection had shaped physiology to bring those behaviors to fruition uh, because they had some sort of adaptive benefit uh, to the, the individuals in the helping role. So when I did a, a review of this literature, it seems that this non-parental helpers and their hormones in birds is actually a fairly kind of mixed bag. Uh, in some cases, helping doesn't seem to affect their hormones at all. In other cases, uh, the helper's hormonal patterns seem to just mirror what you see in the, the breeding pair themselves. So male birds, if they're helping, oftentimes it's the older offspring of the breeding pair. Uh, their testosterone and prolactin will change in the same way as the breeding male. But in a handful of studies, they actually there's been some kind of elegant work uh, with different J species that I'll talk about in a minute um, that show that there is some differentiation in terms of hormonal patterns uh, that suggest that natural selection can modify physiology in unique ways for alloparental care. So the first of these studies was uh, done by someone uh, 
Shake, I think, is, is how you might pronounce that, shoke. But what they found is that prolactin in non-breeders who are helping, based on their provisioning rate, if, they, if the non-breeding helpers visit the nest and feed the nestlings, their prolactin is significantly elevated. If the non-breeders or non-breeding non-helpers, same age, same environment, same species, uh, if they're not visiting the nest and feeding nestlings, their prolactin is lower. This pattern is not observed in the breeding pairs. So the provisioning rate of the actual male and female who produce the nestlings, their prolactin is not related to their provisioning of those, those nestlings. So this appears to be a specific adaptive response related to non-parental helping. Based on this study, uh, Brown and Vleck did another uh, kind of complementary study where they looked at two sympatric uh, J species, so two species sharing an environment, one in which uh, non-breeding helpers uh, assist the breeding pair in raising young, and they found that in that species, the non-breeding helpers have significantly elevated prolactin, and in the closely related species that shares an environment with them, they found that that was not the case. So non-breeders in the western scrub jay do not show elevated prolactin, whereas they do in the Mexican jay. Given the close relatedness of these two species and the fact that they're sympatric and sharing an environment, uh, Brown and Vleck suggested actually that this, this indicated selection on the owl parental caregivers themselves that drove up the prolactin levels overall for the Mexican jays. So it was actually specific selection on the helpers that kind of led to elevated prolactins overall in the Mexican jay versus the Western scrub jay. So this is, uh, those two kind of studies are really the most uh, rigorous and, and thorough uh, tests of this idea that natural selection could shape uh, helpers physiology that I was able to find. Uh, in mammals, it's a little bit more mixed. Uh, helpers have higher prolactin in some species, like wolves and meerkats. They don't have higher prolactin in other species, such as tamarins and striped mice. Um, in non-human primate, uh, New World monkeys, common marmosets, uh, some of our colleagues found that prolactin was elevated after carrying. So when L caregivers helped to, to transport young, their prolactin was elevated. Uh, but this was the same pattern that was uh, observed in fathers. So it, they're really kind of, they seem to be following the same pattern as fathers. Um, so there's more evidence in mammals where it does exist that the L caregivers are sort of just harnessing parental physiology pathways um, with less evidence that selection is actually directly acted on L caregivers specifically to elicit physiological mechanisms um, related to, to helping. Now, there's primatologists in the room, so they could certainly correct me if I'm wrong. But to my knowledge, um, there's never been, I couldn't find any studies where they actually looked at the hormone levels of, say, juvenile non-human primates. So in colobines, where langur monkeys help raise or uh, at, participate in owl mothering. I could not find any studies that had looked at the physiology of that kind of system. And so this is an important distinction because the the studies I've just reviewed generally focus, focus on adult helpers who in most ways are reproductively um, and physiologically similar to the adult breeding pair, where in humans, the two groups that I've highlighted as potential helpers are older siblings who are not yet reproductively capable and postmenopausal women who have kind of shut down their, their reproductive um, activity. So this... Uh, lends itself to some uh, interesting questions uh, about what type of hypotheses we might propose in terms of looking at grand maternal physiology. So what I'm gonna do now uh, for the remainder of my talk is simply walk through a few hypotheses about hormones we might look at in grandmothers, um, talk about their potential, uh, and then wrap up so we can go eat. So uh, the grandmother hypothesis, probably many of you are familiar with this, um, was a very uh, elegant idea proposed by Kristen Hawkes and colleagues and uh, later sort of expanded on in Sarah Hurdy's Mothers and Others. Uh, Hawkes and colleagues proposed that uh, the grandmother hypothesis accounted for human longevity, um, delayed maturation, 
um, shorter inner birth intervals with enhanced brand offspring survival, um, both of which have found some support or substantial support in the empirical literature looking at kind of contemporary human populations as well as past human populations um, in places like Canada uh, and Scandinavia where they have really rigorous historical records. So there's less consensus in the literature that uh, the role of grandmothers actually accounts for the evolution of menopause and longev longevity. But overall, there seems to be some agreement that uh, it's plausible that through inclusive fitness, um, I've just included sort of Hamilton's um, equation here, which is uh, the cost to the altruistic individual um, need to be less than the benefits accrued by the person, the individual receiving the altruistic behavior multiplied by their uh, coefficient of relatedness or the likelihood that the receiving individual carries the same altruistic gene. So this is the, the kind of genetic uh, heritable pathway through which the benefits of grandmothering might be achieved. So what do grandmas other actually do across cultural lines? Uh, Hoxton uh, and her collaborators really focused on the role of grandmothers in uh, extracting these hard to to dig out tubers among the Hadza, um, so really focused on the provisioning of calories to mothers and, and grand offspring. Uh, Jeff Winking and Bruce, uh, uh, Bruce. Brooke Selza uh, have focused on the role of grandmothers as direct caregivers. And then I proposed a model uh, in 2010 that really focused on the energetic savings that owl caregivers can provide to mothers uh, by virtue of helping to carry uh, young, which is the second most costly uh, expenditure incurred by mothers um, uh, across primate lines outside of lactation. So this is just kind of a, a rough approximation for what grandma, grandmothers can actually do to help out mothers. In terms of looking at grand maternal hormones, uh, I think two of the, the initial hormones that one might consider looking at uh, based on their importance in the ovulatory cycle, but especially in pregnancy, is estrogen and progesterone. So again, from a logical perspective, one might initially think to look at these in, uh, in grandmothers. However, we know that uh, due to ovarian uh, depletion and overall lack of responsiveness of the ovaries to uh, follicle-stimulating hormone, that uh, after menopause, estradiol, estrogen levels uh, generally um, flatline in in postmenopausal women. So that's probably not a terrible fruitful hormone to look at. Uh, I, it was, I had trouble finding a lot of studies on progesterone in, in postmenopausal women outside of studies where they administered progesterone and progesterone uh, related derivatives to women on estrogen replacement therapy um, in the postmenopausal period. Um, I know uh, Michelle Wirth is here, and she is uh, <laughs> probably one of the the world's leading experts on uh, the role of progesterone as kind of a psychobiological um, mood enhancer or, or mood effector. So she can probably correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but um, at this point I don't think that there's a lot of uh, impetus for really looking at progesterone in postmenopausal women as a hormone that might kind of increase their effectiveness in grand maternal care. So I'm gonna cross that off. The third hormone uh, is oxytocin. Um, oxytocin, um, I think, is, is a kind of a sexy hormone right now. We know it plays an important role in uh, lactation and has a lot of uh, importance for mother-infant bonding um, across mammals. Now, one potential limitation of looking at oxytocin in grandmothers is that we know that estrogen plays an important role in increasing um, oxytocin receptor expression in critical areas in the brain, as well as oxytocin receptor binding. Um, Francis, who will speak after lunch, has done some of the most elegant work on this. You can probably speak about it in much greater depth than I can. But what we see in postmenopausal women is that when women are on estrogen replacement therapy, the effects of oxytocin appear to be augmented. So I think that this does um, suggest that, again, this really kind of dramatic decline in estrogen during the menopausal period um, might impact the, the role that oxytocin could play in social interactions um, between grandmothers and their grand offspring. Uh, 
But we do know that if you look at oxytocin in mothers when they're interacting kind of acutely, so over the course of, say, a half an hour or 45 minutes uh, with their, their toddlers, that if mothers engage in high affectionate contact with their toddlers, their oxytocin goes up. If fathers engage in high stimulatory, exploratory play with their children, their oxytocin goes up. So I think that this, the kind of caveat of the, the role of estrogen in enhancing kind of the oxytocin system um, aside, this, these studies do provide uh, some notion that we could look at oxytocin in grandmothers. Um, and then on top of that, there's actually evidence that humans, when interacting with their dogs, and dogs, when interacting with their humans, both of them experience increases in oxytocin. So these two fine-looking subjects are clearly bathing in oxytocin. Um, so I think the fact that we see this in humans interacting with dogs suggests that potentially you could see this with grandmothers interacting with their offspring, or a grand offspring. So these are just speculative hypo hypothetical graphs. They don't come from any study. So just bear that in mind. So I'm suggesting the possibility that helping grandmothers grandmothers who are frequently involved with assisting their own daughters uh, with care might experience an increase in oxytocin um, after interacting in a positive way with their grandchild, and that this, over time, might help reinforce that behavioral pattern. Not helping grandmothers uh, might experience no change or a slight decline in oxytocin um, if on the occasions when they might interact with their grandchild. So this is perhaps a, a hypothesis that's worth testing in the future. A fourth hormone that I've talked about already today is prolactin. Um, I didn't find a lot of research on prolactin in postmenopausal women either, so please bear with the kind of, these are relatively old graphs here. But I put a bar at the average level of prolactin for postmenopausal women. So you can see that over time, as women are aging and as they enter postmenopause, their uh, overall Prolactin levels decline. This probably also has to do with estrogen, as estrogen increases the uh, proliferation of the, the lactotrophs, the actual cells in the pituitary that produce prolactin. But in this relatively small study that I found where they compared prolactin levels between postmenopausal women and men in their 20s and 30s, uh, you can actually see that the baseline levels for postmenopausal women are substantially higher than the young males. Um, these males are roughly the same age as the ones I studied, um, where I found that prolactin was elevated among fathers. Um, and among the postmenopausal women, as you can see by the error bars, there's pretty substantial variation. So potentially, I'm just using this as uh, a kind of talking point in terms of the variation that might exist between postmenopausal women, such that you might hypothesize that helping grandmothers have higher prolactin than non helping grandmothers. Um, from a mechanistic perspective, um, we know that serotonin, serotonogic, serotonin, serotonin, I'm very hungry, <laughs> serotonin. Serotonin uh, tone in postmenopausal women uh, has to do with mood, and we know that higher serotonin uh, relates to higher prolactin, so that could be one possible mechanism by which uh, kind of elevated prolactin and helping grandmothers could take place. And then finally, um, since I spent all the time talking about uh, testosterone, I, I want to talk briefly about androgens. Uh, testosterone is an androgen, as is DHEAS, and as is androstenedione. As you can see, I've kind of uh, exaggerated the, the lines of best fit here. And you can see that as women move through the reproductive prime and into the, the postmenopausal period, their androgens are essentially uh, flattening out uh, this, again, has a lot to do with uh, the behavior of the ovaries, but also the uh, behavior of the adrenals. Now, uh, in 2010, our research team showed that we, you actually see the same pattern in Filipino mothers, largely, that you see in Filipino fathers, which is to say that mothers of young children uh, have substantially lower testosterone than non-mothers, and mothers of older children have sort of intermediate values between the two. So this might suggest that we could look at lower androgens in grandmothers or hypothesize that they might be lower in helping grandmothers. Um, I'm actually going to go the opposite way and suggest that given that uh, grandmothers have kind of entered this period in which 
they're no longer reproductively viable, if you will. The role of androgens in kind of promoting their mating-related activity um, is probably uh, fairly low. But what we do know in, in the studies are relatively mixed is that when you administer androgens to postmenopausal women, oftentimes their energy goes up, their vigor goes up, um, they report, report less depressive symptoms. So it's plausible that grandmothers with higher androgens, higher DHEAS, or higher testosterone um, actually might be more effective in terms of their caregiving role, especially if it's focused on provisioning, as Hawks has argued among the, the Hadza. Uh, and now, this is, I think, the look that was on his face during the debate. Uh, after Franz's talk last night with all the wonderful videos, Barry's talk with the wonderful videos, uh, Katie's great visual stimuli, you're probably thinking, this guy loves graphs. <laughs> or, where's he going with this? Or finally, and I think my colleagues and wife can attest that this is my own personal favorite, so I'm going to wrap up now, this is the bottom line. But what I've, what I've laid out here are three hypotheses, that we might see increased oxytocin in grandmothers interacting with their grandchildren, particularly if they frequently help, that those same helping grandmothers might show increased prolactin, and that they might actually show increased androgens. I think the oxytocin hypothesis, hypothesis would simply suggest that grandmothers are sort of tapping into uh, a, a neurobiological system that relates to human social capabilities in general that's probably derived from uh, a neurobiological system that originally evolved to facilitate mother-infant bonding. In terms of increased prolactin, it's possible that uh, if grandmothers showed increased prolactin, they're simply kind of tapping into the neurobiological substrates of parenting, and they're not necessarily showing um, anything terribly unique about grand maternal uh, physiology in and of itself. So it's only this last hypothesis that I've proposed that would really suggest that there was any specific selection on grand maternal physiology. And now I'm going to shoot down that hypothesis because George Williams, in all of his infinite wisdom, um, laid out an elegant model explaining the reasons that the strength of natural selection substantially decreases as individuals age and the, reproduct or the reproductive potential declines. And so in order, for there have, in order for there to have been specific selection on grand maternal androgens, on, their, on grand maternal DHEAS, on their testosterone, or even on their prolactin or oxytocin, there would have had to have been just overwhelmingly important effects um, in terms of increasing their own daughter's fecundability, increasing their grand offspring's survivability, um, and their, those grand offspring's abilities to reproduce as adults. And it seems very, very unlikely, um, especially given some of the elegant mathematical models that have come out of showing why the grandmother hypothesis probably doesn't account for longevity, that this sort of evolutionary scenario uh, would likely have played out. It doesn't mean that. That's a lot of words. I'm just going to skip to this one. We know there's a lot of grand, uh, variation in grand maternal effects uh, through time in different historical circumstances, in different cultures today, among individuals. Um, this is kind of very similar to what we know about the role of fathers in fatherhood effects. And so in general, I think there's really intriguing possibilities for, for studying how grandmothers respond to interacting with their grand offspring and understanding what those kind of physiological patterns, what potential those patterns may have for how they interact and how those relationships develop, in much in the same way we need to understand that about fathers, but I just am not entirely sure that kind of the, the evolutionary rationale that natural selection could have shaped grand maternal physiology necessarily plays out. Thank you. Oh, it's fine. I was so interested in the. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. I was so interested in the 
comment that you made or some of the findings you reported about age effects in terms of the age of the infant on the testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if anybody's tried to follow up. It, it opens a whole array of questions about what are the mechanisms, what are the infant stimuli, what aspect of that interaction is eliciting the hormonal changes, right. and then what gets turned off as the infant gets older. And I thought, that, I don't know if there's any work that's been done on that. <laughs> well, so as you can see, based on the speed of the rate at which I was talking and the fact that I probably still ran over, um, I didn't have time to get into some of the other studies that have been done. But one of the, the really interesting and sort of perplexing things uh, about father-child interaction is when we look at it, you know, Martin Moeller's study where he compared the cultural groups and he found that among the Hadza, where the fathers help take care of young, the testosterone's lower among fathers. And then in our study, where we found connections between, pardon me, childcare and testosterone and co-sleeping and, and testosterone, all of that suggests that something about interacting with uh, dependent offspring helps to, to reduce men's testosterone. But when you actually have men interact with their children and look at their minute-to-minute -minute hormonal changes, their testosterone doesn't change. It's never been found. Um, I conducted a study in the Philippines with that same sample of men. We found no change in testosterone when men interacted with their toddlers. Anne Story conducted a study in Canada where, with a very similar research design to my study and found that n there was no testosterone change in Canadian fathers. And Peter Gray conducted a study in Jamaica where he had men interact with their toddlers and there was no change in testosterone. So, I mean, we're, we're all looking at father-toddler interaction. Maybe there's something about father-neonate, father-infant interaction that, that has some different, uh, there's a different stimuli there that's affecting um, men at the neurobiological level that's trickling down to their um, gonadal production of testosterone, but that, it's really a wide open area. Um, similarly, I found these elevations and prolactin in fathers of infants, and then when I had men interact with their toddlers, their prolactin went down. And when Ann Story had fathers <laughs> interact with their toddlers, their prolactin went down. So there's some really interesting uh, discrepancies between what happens um, in kind of a reactivity setting, minute to minute, and what we seem to be picking up in terms of more stable longitudinal uh, hormonal patterns. So um, it's a really fascinating area. Uh, it, there's a lot of rich, rich questions to be asked. Um, there was recently a paper that just came out a few months ago that showed it was the first study to ever link paternal hormone levels to brain activity. And they found that men's testosterone um, levels after interacting with their children correlated to their brain activity when they were exposed to pictures of their own infants days later, weeks later. So there does seem to be some connection between kind of hormones in general, or men circulating testosterone levels and, and their brain activity, which is what we think would likely have to happen in order for the hypothalamus to downregulate GnRH production, which eventually would lead to lower LH production, which would lead to lower uh, testicular production of testosterone. But what the specific stimuli are that lead to that, that cascading event is yet to be discovered. <laughs> Sorry. It's good to know that I know too much. Um, there was a study of non-human primate fathers, uh, common marmosets, I believe, uh, by T Shelley Prudhomme out of Tony Ziegler's lab at Wisconsin that showed that if you expose common marmoset fathers to their own infant's odor, that, and they're probably more, Franz or Katie could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're more olfactory uh, oriented than say we are. Um, if you expose their infants, their fathers to their own infant's odor, their testosterone declines relatively uh, quickly. So, I mean, that's at least one suggestive non-human primate study as to how sensory stimuli might affect uh, these systems. I've got the microphone. I'll give it to you next, Peter. Um, so uh, just to follow up on that question, um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that you said that 
there's a negative correlation between dopamine and prolactin. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, the study that you just mentioned, um, do you think that playing with their toddlers or infants are tapping into uh, reward neurocircuitry and that's why the prolactin went down? Or could you talk a little bit further about the activation of the dopaminergic system and what you think might be going on there? That is, that's what I, that was the explanation I gave in our paper uh, when we found that, was that men, particularly men who would volunteer to be observed interacting with their toddlers, probably like interacting with their toddlers, and probably find that relative re, relatively rewarding. So uh, their dopaminergic pathways are probably um, excited by that, which leads, there's uh, a sort of set of dopamine neurons, the tuberal and fundibular neurons that release dopamine into the uh, pituitary stalk and affect lactotrophs. So that's probably how that happens. I think um, one of the more interesting things, questions, if you kind of turn that on its head is, well, why would fathers of infants have elevated prolactin if that somehow means that their, their reward system is inhibited? And so what I was, actually recently I was uh, trying to do some research on how that occurs in mothers because you wouldn't expect, you might even know more about this than I do, uh, you wouldn't expect that it would be particularly adaptive for the dopamine reward systems to not be active in mothers when they're lactating. But we know that prolactin is critical to lactation. And so what I found is actually that there seems to be, and they don't really know how this is possible, but it seems that um, prolactin is supposed to feed back onto the dopamine neurons that regulate prolactin. So if prolactin gets up too high, that kicks back to the dopamine system. Dopamine's released, prolactin goes down. That system seems to be dysregulated or inhibited in lactating mothers. So uh, it's something, the jack stat pathway, but uh, it's, it doesn't work the way that it works under non-lactating circumstances. So whether, but they don't know, they couldn't trace the mechanism that far back. So all they could really say is, well, we found out that this, that this kind of signaling pathway is not working um, in the way that we would expect under normal circumstances, but we don't really know why. And that was in rodents. Um, and so whether something similar is going on in human fathers and how that might take place, I think I, I would expect that if, you know, if, this, if these findings are replicated and we see that there is a robust pattern, you know, if we were able to look at prolactin in, in, the, in the ACA and we saw these same sort of patterns or we saw even more robust patterns, um, you know, it begin to suggest that similar to testosterone, that, that this is maybe a, an adaptive system, I would expect that there's gotta be some connection there. Um, there. There has to have evolved some ability for the dopamine system to still work without inhibiting prolactin release, I guess. Um, because it doesn't make intuitive sense that prolactin could be so important to the expression of paternal care that you would want fathers to not then experience the reward of that paternal care. Peter? The teenage boys who um, have experienced babysitting their infant siblings mm -hmm. are much more nurturant and less aggressive in their interactions with their peers than our um, teenage boys who don't have that experience. Uh, the best study I know of is one done long ago in a village in Kenya where the teenage boys in question were the ones that did not have sisters of an age that they could do the traditionally feminine task of taking care of the infants. So they were recruited to do that, and lo and behold, they were less <laughs> aggressive and more nurturant with their own peers, which suggests, you know, I'd never thought of this before, and there's some other evidence, too, for this kind of effect, Su suggests the interesting possibility that maybe, to some degree, there could be a neuroendocrine component to that. That's, uh, that's fascinating. I would love... Um I can give you my card and you can, <laughs> you can send me those citations. It's, that's really um, fascinating. It's something, um, if an vol edited volume comes out of our symposium, I, would, I mean, I would love to, to talk about that. You know, one of the things that um, out of Ann's Stories Lab that they found is they looked at fathers interacting uh, with their, their own offspring 
and they looked at how their prolactin responded to that, and they found variation, substantial differences based on whether, uh, based on the father's birth order themselves. So whether they had younger siblings, and whether they engaged in helping to take care of them when they were growing up, uh, predicted how their own prolactin responded to interacting with their offspring. So there, there does seem to be some really interesting developmental components to this, and I know it's something Darsha and I have talked about before. Um, now, in this case, are we talking earlier experiences of taking care of, of siblings predicts teenage behavior, or like, are they occurring at the same time, I guess? They were occurring at the same time. Okay, because, I mean, what's really interesting about that possibility is the actual taking care of the young is reducing the teenage boy's testosterone, and, and that's leading them to kind of be less aggressive. Um, I mean, it's plausible, because they're reproductively, you know, they're, they're functioning. In a, in a reproductively uh, typical adult way, uh, whereas the, the study from Ann Sori's lab was looking you know, at things that occurred early in childhood and then were predicting uh, later physiological function in adulthood. But I think it's a really interesting possibility.